computer. Okay, we are now recording, I believe, on our last uh, Zoom session for 125 Hearing Disorders. And the topic today is pseudo hypocusis, faking hearing loss. Often this is called a non-organic hearing loss. In English, that means there's nothing organic, there's nothing biological causing the hearing loss. It's psychological, okay? Non-organic. People who fake hearing loss are sometimes called malingerers. The person is malingering. Now, a lot of stuff comes from the army. A lot of things in our field arose at the VA centers. Our field, the crucible of its birth was the army, the U.S. Army. Okay? When people returned after World War II as veterans, a lot of people had hearing loss. But some people were faking hearing loss. And so the VA centers had a real forensic kind of a kind of a guilty until proven innocent sort of an approach to the person. Oh, you got hearing loss? Well, let's just see if you've got hearing loss, which isn't a kind thing to do. But I mean, one of the biggest centers was in Chickasha, Oklahoma. I used to live in Oklahoma, and there's a big VA center in Chickasha. And uh, that they did a lot of this, uh, a lot of this stuff. So, anyway, gold bricking is another term for faking hearing loss, malingering, non-organic. Uh, I think some people call it uh, hysterical deafness. Get this. Talk about a sexist thing. A hysterectomy, okay, comes from the word being hysterical. Talking about women being hysterical, like like hormones or something. It's really bad. It's hysterical deafness, faking hearing loss, non-organic hearing loss, malingering, all these terms. Okay, so let's go to our notes now. Share screen and look where we've got. And uh, we'll pull up some notes here. Okay, so go to starting at the very top. Pseudohypocusis, I'm not sure if it's even in Martin 13 anymore. I have an old edition, but it implies a false, exaggerated hearing loss. Sometimes it's easy to recognize malingerers, but sometimes not. And I'm just reading you, just from the notes here. Reasons are often financial. Sometimes, however, they're to gain attention. So if you want to talk about two profiles and it's not I'm, I'm, I know I'm profiling here just like cops will profile and stop people who look like they're the part of the you know two profiles are 64 year old males just about to go on retirement okay faking hearing loss pension okay another another profile is young adolescent girls not getting the attention that their that their peers are getting. Maybe they feel they're too skinny, too fat, or whatever. They've got issues, and so they're feeling sorry for themselves, and they want a problem. Nine-year-old boys, little jerks, just being a pain in the ass. Just, just. I was terribly afraid of my father when I was nine years old. He would ask me to move this or move the sprinkler here or do that, and inevitably I would do it wrong, and he'd be mad at me. I told my mom, I've got a hearing loss. I can't hear. I can't hear him. And literally, I was so afraid I was going to make a mistake, I'd make a mistake. So I went in for a hearing test. I was faking it through. They caught me. Okay, this is what people do. Okay, they do. People do things for various reasons, and as a clinician, you are going to encounter this once in a while, and your blood is going to boil. And you must control yourself and never point a finger of accusation at the client. Always allow the person to save face and back out so the person knows that he or she is caught, but you're not telling them that he's lying or she's lying. The person kind of figures it out him or herself as he or she's driving home and doesn't come back. So never accuse, just say, hmm, something's weird with my equipment, or uh, I don't know what it is today. I'm just not, I just can't, the test results just don't quite add up. I don't know what it is. It, it's just me, I guess. You know, just always never accuse of lying because you're going to, what do you call it, accelerate and 
exacerbate the situation. No, don't do that. Okay, so I will read in our notes here where we were. Reasons mostly financial, sometimes to gain attention or to avoid some undesirable task. There you go. Also higher in veterans, industrial workers, medical legal cases. Most politically correct term is non-organic or functional hearing loss. Other terms are psychogenic, conversion, malingering, hysterical deafness. <laughs> Old military term, gold bricking, person who fakes a disability to get out of something. The prevalence is, high, prevalence is highly variable. It depends on the population examined. In general, the prevalence in adult population is less than 2%. But look at this, what I'm highlighting right here. There's very few comprehensive studies because the cooperation needed from subjects for this data is rather hard to get. Can you kind of figure that out? Okay. Look at what Sprague's found in 1994. For a group considered for cochlear implants, now look at this, cochlear implants is for someone who's deaf, right? Who can't benefit from hearing aids. For a group considered for cochlear implants, five of 600 uh, patients showed pseudohypacusis. Look at that. That would mean that the person was so into faking his or her hearing loss that he or she was willing to get a cochlear implant. It's got to be pretty sad. So you've got a whole group of patients, 600 people, and they're all considered cochlear implant uh, uh, candidates because they're all deaf, and they find out that five of the 600 were lying about their hearing loss. You know, what does it take? Like what, what is the person's issues? You know, so it's, it's, it, people are strange. It's a, so let's, let's find out what the tests are that are used to find out if someone's faking. That's what you and I have to know as clinicians. Now we've studied what it is, but now let's, what are the tests used to find it? Well, the first ones are behavioral and it may really, what do you call it? Just not the results are inconsistent. Your test results are inconsistent. Normal speech, good voice quality, person claims to have excellent lip reading skills, overplays being hard of hearing, excessive details about the hearing loss handicap. You'll see lots of false negative responses, but not false positives. Now, you remember what false negatives and false positives are. So I'm showing it to you here on a picture now in your PowerPoint slides that go with this prison, with this topic. Look at the, the, the top, look what it says, thresholds and decisions. If the tone is present and you heard it and you said yes, that's a true positive. If the tone is absent and you said you didn't hear it, that's a true negative. If, however, the tone is absent and you put your hand up, that's a false positive. On the other hand, if the tone is present and you, you don't say you hear it, that's a false negative. So remember, it's just like tests with retrocochlear pathology. You can have false positives, false negatives, right? Sensitivity versus specificity. And we said that that topic also goes with thresholds. So when you're talking someone faking a hearing loss, you'll see a lot of false negatives. The tone is present, of course, and the person doesn't want to tell you, obviously, okay? Back to the notes. Non always allow an honorable way out. Don't directly confront the client. Refrain from immediate value judgment. Mention test inconsistencies. Shift the blame on your equipment. See that your audiometer is acting up. Re-instruct, saying, perhaps I didn't tell you to raise your hand even if the tone is really soft. But always remember, we're not psychologists. Our scope of practice is to find, it's not our scope of practice to find conscious or unconscious reasons to delve into the person's issues. That's not our field. The toughest part is often writing the report. <laughs> okay? And what you're talking about is test inconsistencies. The biggest test inconsistency that you will find with malingerers 
Speech reception thresholds do not agree with pure tone averages. Remember audiometry? Okay, what's your pure tone average? Parent Teachers Association, PTA. Okay, what's your pure tone average? What three frequencies are those? Five, one, and two. So what's your thresholds? What's the average of your thresholds at 500, 1,000, and 2,000 hertz? Take the average for one ear. Call it, say if it's 10, okay? What's the speech reception threshold going to be? Should be 10. SRT, the softest that you can hear speech, should agree with the pure tone average. It should be within plus or minus 5 dB. So if a person's pure tone average is 50, the SRT should be 45, 50, 55. If it's more than that away, something's wrong. Either your audiometer is out of calibration, or the person's lying, or you don't know what you're doing. Okay? They've got to be, they are the first things to look for with malingerers is SRT, pure tone average disagreement. That's a validity test. That's a test of, are you really testing what you say you're testing? It, you're checking the validity of your test by doing B SRT. And the first thing that people do in auditing an office is they'll pull one file from the A's, one from the B's, one from the C's, and the first thing you look at is SRT, pure tone average agreement. Let's see, I get, you can tell whether you gotta fire the clinician or not. Does the person know what he or she's doing? And I challenge you to do this when you're on a clinical placement. Be nice, but check, to look at audiograms, look at them in the, in, the, in the office, and look at the SRT pure tone average agreement. It's a, when people don't know what they're doing very well as a clinician, you'll find lots of disagreement, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself, so let's go back into our notes again. Non-behavioral testing is effective, okay? It's the best test. ABRs, autoacoustic emissions, acoustic reflexes, those are non-behavioral tests. They're very good at telling whether someone's lying or not because lying is a voluntary behavioral thing. So, you know, SRT, pure tone average disagreement, is a behavioral test. It works. It, it does work, but remember, it's behavioral. Most early tests were behavioral in the early days of audiology. These aren't used very much anymore. They can identify pseudo-hypocusis, faking, but they can't estimate the true hearing loss. That's the problem with behavioral, okay? So what, give me an example of behavioral method. SRT, pure tone average disagreement or agreement. Not a bad, idea. It's, it's a good test. I mean, a good thing to look at, but it doesn't really help to assess the degree of the true hearing loss, okay? It's just kind of like, I don't know, you just know the person's lying. So anyway, but the, it takes a bit of practice to do. Most, most clinicians, some behavioral tests, people don't know how to do very well. But again, let's look at the first one. Check this out. Electrodermal. Oh, bad. This is what they did at VA centers. They would put, in a, they would put something on this finger and that finger. Then they take this hand and they put an electrode here and an electrode here. And they give you, they make you hear tones. And every time you heard a tone, they gave you a shock. <laughs> and in your other hand, they measured the increase of sweat in the skin because you're, you got an electrical shock. <laughs> Okay, so then you began to, they, they're, they're Pavlovian, they're conditioning you. Every time you hear a tone, you get a little shock, and that, they measure a little bit of increase in skin sweat in this. So, now you decide to fake, the, fake it that you don't hear, but you're, here, you're, you're, now, you're now conditioned. So when you hear the tone, you're preparing to get the shock, and they catch you. That's how lie detector tests were invented came from our field, okay? So it's a real Pavlovian, they call it electrodermal audiology. It's not used anymore, but it was used at the VA centers. 
to pick out hearing loss malingerers. We, it's, it's a strange field. I mean, when you look at the history of our field, in the early 1950s, late 40s, 50s, early 60s, it was often major so-and-so, general so-and-so. They had their PhDs, and they had a doctoral degree in psychology or in electronics, and hearing aids were all body aids. They were just learning this field. They were putting it all together. And it all came out of the VA centers. Just You need to know that historically. That's the crucible of our field's birth. Anyway, all right. No, I'm behaved. So this, this here is just for your own fun. I just described it, okay? So that's at the bottom of the page, bottom of page one. Another old test was the varying intensity story test. Now, this is kind of a weird one, too. I'll go to this test here. Look at this. No, not that. Test. Look at this. They give you, this is good for you when you're faking hearing loss in one ear. And they would present this information above the threshold of one ear and this below the threshold of the ear that you were faking okay and then they would these parts of the stories would come out of the headphones and then they would give you a little quiz afterwards on what the story was about and if you answered correctly questions that you shouldn't have been able to hear in the bad ear they caught you okay Again, the swinging stories test, not used anymore. It's behavioral. It's not very, it's not very sensitive. It's not very specific. It's just kind of, eh. Again, because it's behavioral. They're presenting information to the good ear above the, the threshold, and they're presenting information to the bad ear just below its claimed threshold. So if you're bad ear, you're claiming an 80 decibel hearing loss, they might present this at about 70 or 60. If you were faking the hearing loss in the bad ear, you shouldn't be able to hear anything in, let's say, part two and call, whoops, in this whole column. All that information should be missing. If you were able to answer on a test afterwards some correct information that you weren't able to hear in the first place, they caught you, okay? Again, there's an, another, non, another behavioral test no longer used. All right, share screen, move on to page two. Okay, get out of this one. Go to the notes. Good. So that's the bottom of page one. We move on down. Here's another test that's behavioral. And you should put a star by this one because it is used sometimes. Okay? It's called the Stenger test. Now, the Stenger test, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I'm going to describe it, and then we'll look at the notes and what it says here. The Stenger test is used if I'm faking a hearing loss in one ear and the other ear is normal. So it's not a test to, to look for faking hearing loss in both ears. It's a test when you're, when you're for unilateral faked loss. You present the, a tone to the good ear at 10 dB above the threshold. So let's say the guy's threshold at 1,000 hertz is 10. You're going to present the, the tone at 20. So he hears it, definitely. Got it? Good. In the bad ear, let's say the guy's faking a 50 decibel hearing loss. So you're now going to present the tone at 40 dB in the bad ear. In other words, less than his threshold. He's claiming a 50 dB hearing loss. You're going to present the tone to the bad ear at 40. Okay. So what should happen if the hearing loss is real? Okay. You're presenting now the two tones simultaneously. Tone to the good ear at 10 dB above its threshold. Tone to the bad ear at 10 dB below its threshold. And what should happen if the person really has the hearing loss in the bad ear? He should raise his hand because he hears the tone in the good ear. You're going to tell him, raise a hand if you hear a tone. Just anywhere. Just let me know if you hear a tone. 10 dB above the threshold of the good ear. 10 dB below the threshold of the bad ear, present the tone simultaneously. The guy should, yeah, I hear something here. Yeah, okay. If he's faking the hearing loss, guess what? He's only going to, he's going to hear the tone in his bad ear louder than this, isn't he? If, he, if he's faking the hearing loss, he's hearing the tone here at 40 and the tone here at 20. What happens when you hear two tones of different intensities? 
If you're a tone, if I presented to you a tone of 10 dB in one ear and a tone of 50 dB in the other ear, what's going to happen to you? You're only going to hear the tone in the louder ear. Okay, and just 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 FYI, this is lateralization. Got a thousand hertz tone. I present the tone to one ear at 10 dB, and I present the thousand hertz tone to the other ear at 50 dB. Where are you going to hear the tone? Only the 50. You're not going to hear it louder here and softer here. You're only going to hear the louder stimulus. Okay? This is the fundamental basis behind the Stenger test. If two tones are presented simultaneously, they're the same frequency, and one is louder and the other one is softer, you're only going to hear the louder tone. You're not going to hear the softer one. Got it? Good. Now back to the Stenger. You're faking a 50 decibel loss in one ear, and this ear here is at 10 dB. So you present the tone at 20 to the good ear. You present the tone at 40 to the bad ear. Okay? If you're telling the truth, if this hearing loss is real, you're going to hear the tone in the good ear. You're going to say, I hear it over here. But if you're faking it, you're going to hear the tone over here because this is louder. Right? Okay, so let's say your hearing is 10 dB in both ears, but you're faking it that you can't hear it in this ear. So this, this ear is getting 40, this ear is only getting 20. So, but you're lying, so you don't want to raise your hand, so you're keeping your hand down. Caught you. You're lying. You should be saying you hear a tone in this ear. Okay, but you can't hear the tone in this ear right now because this one's louder. Okay, you do hear a tone. It's louder in the bad ear, but you don't want to tell the clinician that because you're lying. So you keep your hand down. Okay, if you were telling the truth, you'd be saying, yeah, I hear a tone in this ear. If this ear really did have a hearing loss, you wouldn't hear the 40 dB. You couldn't hear it, but you would hear this tone. But since you're lying and you got normal hearing in both ears, you do hear the tone in this ear. You can't hear it in this ear at all. You truly can't, but you do hear it here, but you don't want to tell me that. And then, you want to know the coup de grace? This is how you finally kill them, okay? You take away the tone, the 40 dB tone in the, in the bad ear that he's lying about. You take that away, and all of a sudden, <gasps> he raises his hand because he hears his tone. Now let's read the notes. Let's go to the notes, because I know people get really confused at this, so that's why I wrote you the notes. So let's read this together. The Stenger test, still used by some clinicians for faked unilateral hearing loss, works best when there's a large difference between the thresholds of the ears. Based on psychoacoustics for normal hearing loss, put a star by this. If two tones, same frequency, presented at same time to both ears, only the louder tone is heard. So I need you to underline, because that's the underlying thing beneath the Stenger test, okay? You need a two-channel audiometer. So here you go. Present the tone to the good ear at 10 dB sensation level. That just means 10 dB louder than the thresholds. So let's say the guy's threshold is zero. You're going to present it at 10. Okay? This certainly will get a response. Next, present the tone at 10 dB below the threshold of the claimed bad ear. So if the guy's faking a 50 decibel loss, present it at 40. 10 dB less. So the person should not be able to theoretically hear it. So if no response, the person either couldn't hear it or else he's lying, right? Okay, now present both tones simultaneously and ask the client to raise a hand if he hears anything, either ear. So now you're presenting the tone to the good ear at 10 dB because his threshold is zero, so you're at 10 dB louder than the threshold, and you're presenting it to the bad ear at 10 dB less than the claimed threshold. So one ear is getting 10 and the other ear is getting 40. Now, negative stinger. Put a star by this one. If the person responds, he or she is telling the truth. 
It means the tone is heard in the good ear and the hearing loss in the bad ear is real. Positive stinger means no response. The tone is actually heard in the bad ear, but the person doesn't want to tell you that. Okay? It's due to the stinger effect. Tone lateralizes only to the bad ear. The tone is simply not heard in the good ear. But the person does hear it in his bad ear, but he's lying to you. He does hear it, but he doesn't want to tell you that. He only hears it in his bad ear because 40 is louder than 10. And when you're getting two tones simultaneously, only the louder is heard. So he's hearing it in the bad ear, but he doesn't want to tell you. If he's telling the truth, he can't hear the 40 dB and he only hears the 10 and he's going to put up his hand. Yeah, I hear something in this ear. But if he's, if he's lying, he hears the tone in his bad ear only because 40 is way more than 10. But he doesn't want to tell you. And now here's the final step, the coup de grace. While presenting both tones simultaneously, take away the tone in the bad ear and just leave the tone in the good ear. And if the person raises his hand, gotcha. Okay, those are the steps I need you to know about the stinger. All right, anything below that, just leave it alone. So just take your pencil or whatever and just go, don't worry about this. Okay, what, what, I, what I've emphasized to you is the essential steps of the Stenger test. So it's a good thing to kind of read it over afterwards, internalize it, and just kind of, okay, I know it's kind of, you, you, you understand it a bit, and then you don't, and then you do, and then you don't. Don't freak about it. Just let it sit for now, and we'll move on. But your homework is to look at that top part of the page and, and kind of digest that, okay? Basically, moving on here, inconsistency on a hearing test battery is the first clue. Now, look where it says shadow audiogram. Shadow audiogram. You see that word right here? Now, let's take a look at one of our PowerPoint slides. Here we go. Your second slide. Now, here's a person's hearing loss on the top left. I wish that bar would go. I can't stand that. Okay, go away. Theoretical tests showing normal hearing in the right ear and a false total loss of hearing in the left ear. Do you see that at the top left? Okay, so here's what's wrong. There's no evidence of cross hearing. Look at the bone scores. They fall off the page too. They're you see the arrows in meaning seem off the list, gone, gone, gone. Now, B is the bottom one. A true, a true total, see the X's here, they're not masked. This is no, no masking was used. No, no sound was kept into the good ear to keep it busy. Okay? So these, these X's are left as X's, they're not squares. They should be. Look at, the, look at the right one. That's what the test should look like if the hearing loss in the bad ear is real. Okay? Masking was done, and here's the bone scores are really off the board, and the thresholds are really indicating total deafness. Now you've got a true, that's, that's what the test should look like if the hearing loss in the left ear is real. This on the top left, mm -mm, impossible, or as they'd say in French, c'est impossible. Okay? Can't happen. How come? Because of interoral attenuation. In reality, by the time I'm putting about 60 dB into the bad ear, it should cross the skull over to the good ear. Right? And I'll stop sharing here and just talk to you. If my left ear is deaf, okay, and my right ear is normal, I can put 10 dB in the deaf ear, I won't hear it. 20, I won't hear it. 30, I won't hear it. 40, I probably won't hear it. 50, now my head is, it's a pail. It'll, my head will only hold so much water. You put more water and it's going to spill over the sides. So by the time I'm putting 60 dB into a dead ear, it's going to cross the skull and get to my good ear. That's why masking is used. So you should, if the person's really telling the truth, and the ear is truly deaf, you should end up with an audiogram that looks like 
this on the bottom. You should see a shadow audiogram. Okay? You should, the person should be saying, I don't know. Guess what? I'm hearing something. I don't know why, but yeah, you're, you're putting the tone in my bad ear, I can tell. But I can hear it, but I hear it over here. Okay? The person, if he's telling the truth, you should see a shadow audiogram. And then as a clinician, you'll say, hey, I'm going to mask the good ear, follow my cursor, and see if these X's don't go all the way down to the bottom. Okay? Because that's what should happen. And that's by air conduction. Look at bone. Look at bone conduction at the top. You put the oscillator behind the bad ear. Okay, look at my, this one here represents the left ear. Left ear. Left ear. Remember your bone symbols always represent the ear that's facing you. Okay, so my left ear, my right ear. Okay, so the greater than in like a math symbol, greater than is the left ear. So when you're looking at the bone, bone uh, thresholds of the, of the uh, bad ear, they should be right up here. And how come? Because what by bone conduction, my head is no longer a pail that will hold 40 or more dB. Uh, uh, now my head's a plate. Okay, it's not going to hold any water. You pour anything on the plate, it's spilling over. But why? Because if you put a bone oscillator behind the dead ear, by the time you put in 10 dB with the oscillator, it's going to cross the skull by bone conduction. Okay? Remember that. This is fundamental audiometry. By air conduction, my head is a pail, and it'll hold 40 dB. That's why you mask if the thresholds are 40 dB or different. Have you learned that in audiometry? Okay, I'm just asking you that, eh? Have you learned that in, in uh, what, what's your audiometry course, 130? I think that's what it is. If you have a 40 or more decibel difference between the ears in air conduction, you need to mask the good ear to find the true thresholds of the bad ear. Because your head is a pail. It's only going to hold X amount of decibels before it spills over. So this is a, this is a classic. When nurses do hearing tests, they don't learn this kind of stuff, obviously. So they'll get a hearing loss like this on the bottom, B, panel B, and they'll say, they'll say the child, you know, they're testing the kid in the hallway at the school. Yeah, the child's got a 50 decibel hearing loss. And in reality, the child may be deaf in the bad ear. The, but the nurses don't know how to do masking. Why should they? That's yours, your job and my job, okay? But with masking, you'll find out that the hearing loss was much greater, of course. All right? So, again, by bone conduction, an oscillator behind the dead ear, okay, should cross the skull to the good ear by the time the tone is 10 dB, okay, so interaural attenuation or inter-ear inter -ear quieting is, is 10 dB or less by bone conduction. I'll just say that in English here to make perfect sense. If my left ear is deaf, I can take a headphone, I can put in 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, keep going. By the time I'm hitting 40, it might begin to cross over. By the time I'm hitting 50, it probably will be crossing over. By the time I hit 60, for sure, it's crossing over. Okay? Now, that's air conduction. Now do bone. Left ear is deaf. I put the tone in at zero. Nothing. Put the tone in at five. I'll probably be raising my hand. Because by bone conduction, I only need to put in 5 to 10 dB before the sound crosses over. Got it? And that is why the shadow audiogram that I keep showing you here, you should see a shadow audiogram. The left ear should kind of look like the right ear, but be about 50 or 60 dB let, you know, below it. And bone conduction should be completely normal. Okay, that's what should happen if the person really has the hearing loss in the left ear. You should see this. If you don't, if you see the top left, the person's obviously lying. He's hearing like crazy, but he's not telling you anything. Okay, so these symbols are impossible. 
This is impossible. If the loss is real, you should see this. Okay? So A is the case of, of someone faking a hearing loss and not, and not telling the truth at all. B is telling the truth unmasked. And C is telling the truth when you're finding it, when, when masking was done. And they kept the good ear busy and found out that the left ear actually didn't hear at 40 or 50 or 60. It's actually deaf. And they put masking in the good ear for bone conduction. And yeah, the bad ear bone conduction shows it's off the board. That's true. Okay, enough on that. Gonna beat this horse till it's dead. All right. So that's that. All right. SRT, pure tone dis average disagreement, is the best indicator for another, uh, the best behavioral indicator for pseudohypacusis. The top one is also good, lack of a shadow audiogram. Okay. Some people are good at making a second response look much like a first response to tones or to speech. But it's often difficult to equate the loudness of speech to the loudness of pure tones. At some at the set, at same dB level, spondy words are going to seem louder than tones because the energy is spread over a wider range of frequencies. Ascending SRTs enhances the disagreement. Sometimes a client will repeat only half the spondees. That indicates the person really heard it as well. Let me just talk in plain language here. If you hear a tone and you're lying, let's say you got normal hearing in both ears. You want to fake a hearing loss. Okay, so you're going to wait until the tone's about 50 dB before you raise your hand in the right ear. Okay, then they can do it, and then they test 2,000 hertz. You're going to wait, and you're going to wait, and yeah, okay, that too, that sounds about 50. That sounds about equally loud as the first one I lied about. Yep, yeah, okay, I'll wait till then. Then they test at 4,000 hertz, and the person can get pretty good at, 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 at lying. Like, okay, waiting till the 4,000 hertz is about as loud as the one in the 2,000 word before he raises his hand, right? So you can do that, and you can fake a hearing loss. Great. Some people are pretty good at it. Try speech now. Try equating the loudness of spawn of speech at 50 compared to the loudness of a tone at 50. When you're talking a pure tone, you're talking one frequency. Right? What did you learn in acoustics? Speech has lots of frequencies. Okay? What do you think this is? A bouquet of these. No, I'm teasing you. Okay? But you got buku frequencies in speech. Oh, lows to highs. Remember the whole spectrum of speech, louder in the vowels, softer in the consonants. So it's hard to equate the loudness of speech to the loudness of a pure tone. You can fake pure tones and wait till they're all about 50 before you decide to raise your hand. But speech at 50 is going to sound louder to you than a pure tone will at 50. And so it's hard for a liar to equate the loudness of speech to the loudness of pure tones to fake a hearing test. That is why SRT will not agree with PTA. SRTs will usually be found at a lesser dB level. So if the person's faking a 50 decibel pure tone hearing loss, his SRTs are probably going to be like 25. They're going to be less. Okay, because speech sounds louder. It's got more frequencies in it. You know, when you see a flock of geese flying over the field, and you'll see them flying like a V. You ever see that in the sky? You ever wonder why one of the lines is longer than the other one? Of course you do, because it's got more geese in it. Okay? At any rate. Okay, so there's more frequencies in speech. So a person can, can get pretty good at lying about a, hear, about a hearing loss and fake an 80 decibel hearing loss, waiting till all the tones sound about equally loud to the person who's going to wait to his level to fake it. And you might find thresholds kind of hovering around 70 or 80. Do SRTs on them? Probably 40 or 50. Okay? So the, the disagreement is always going to be that the speech is heard softer.
Okay, it's never going to be the disagreement isn't going to be that the SRT is 80 and the pure tone average is 50. It's never, not, the error doesn't go in that direction. The error goes in the direction that the SRTs are softer. Okay, the speech reception threshold is less than the pure tone average. Okay, so if the pure tone average, claimed pure tone average is 80, the SRT may very well be 50. If the claimed Pure tone average is 50, the SRT might be like 25. And so the error, well, there'll be a disagreement because they're more than plus or minus 5 dB different, but the disagreement will err in the, way, in the direction of SRTs being heard softer. Got it? Cool. All right. There's another way of checking out disagreements in, in, in hearing tests, but that's, okay, lack of shadow audiogram is a behavioral indication. SRT, pure tone average disagreement, is another indication, okay? Now, you're going to see these slides in your PowerPoint. I'll show you here. Here's your spondy words for SRT testing, right? Airplane, say armchair, baseball, birthday. Remember these from audiometry, okay? Remember the unique thing about spondy testing? Here's, here's a, a speech discrimination words, single syllable words. Say the word and. Say the word yard here. I'll make it bigger so you can see that. Okay, say the word carve. Say the word us. Say the word day. Now, when you're in audiometry, at, uh, uh, just for fun here, at OTC, are you, uh, are you doing um, uh, CD versions, like recorded speech, or are you doing live speech? CD. Recorded? No, yeah, yeah. recording. Yeah, that's very common. It's actually better because the speech is always the same for each person. It's also good for people with language barrier and stuff like that too. So, okay, yeah. But either way, so you know, you can see that the, the single syllable words are for speech discrimination. Okay, that's this slide. Uh, the the, the spawn D words are for SRT testing. And the funny thing about spawn D words is you could look at this. This is showing you pure tones in DBSPL. These are PI functions, and all it means is the intensity level required and how many times you heard it. Okay, so you can see that, let's say tone number one, a thousand hertz. If I'm presenting it below your threshold, you're not going to hear it. If we're presented at, at your threshold, look at this. You're going to hear it. Okay, if I presented anything above your threshold, you're always going to hear it. Okay, same with spondees. Let's say your true threshold is 15. Okay, let's say your threshold for hearing the speech, the spondee words, is 15. If I present the tone at 5, you're never going to hear it. If I present the tone at 10 dB, you'll barely hear it. If I present the tone at 15, you'll usually hear it. If I present the tone at 20, you'll always hear it, right? That's a steep PI function. They use spondees because if I present it below your threshold, you won't hear it. If I present it above your threshold, you'll always hear it, okay? The decibel distance between hearing it all the time or none of the time, that decibel distance is small, just like with pure tones. Same thing, okay? Whereas single syllable words aren't used for SRT testing because look at number two. If I use single syllable words and your threshold was 15 for speech, if I read to you single syllable words at five, you're never going to get them. If I read single syllable words at 10, you'll barely get any. If I read them at 15, you'll barely get them. If I read them at 20, you'll start getting them. If I read them at 30, you'll start getting them more. And now if I read them at 40, yeah, now you're finally getting them all. Okay? That is the reason why these words are not used for SRT testing. These words are, not these, okay? These are used to test the clarity of your hearing. These words are used for speech reception threshold. Why are these words no good for SRT? Because the PI function is sloped. The decibel distance between getting all or 
diddly all ain't small. Look, look at two. The decibel distance is, isn't really fine, isn't small. Anyway, this is just bringing you back to audiometry, but I'm just highlighting here why, W-H-Y, how come single syllable words are not used for SRT testing? Spondees are, not these. And why are these? Because they give a steep decibel function. Okay, the decibel distance between getting all and sweet diddly all is small. Okay, if I'm above your threshold, you're always getting it. If I'm below, you're never getting it. Okay, you know, now let's kind of move on to some non behavioral tests and then we're out of here. Cool. All right, share screen. Look at the uh, let's say, uh, look at uh, uh, notes here. Okay, so moving on down. Oh, yeah, here we go. Here's a third behavioral way. Okay, so you got lack of shadow audiogram, SRT, pure tone averages disagreement, and excellent speech discrimination at really low sensation levels. So let's say the person is faking a hearing loss of 50 dB. Okay, let's say the person's faking a hearing loss of 50 dB. And you are now, whoops, no, I don't want that one. I want this one. Person's faking a hearing loss of 50 dB, and you're presenting words to the guy at 60. How much more is 60 than 50? 10. Let's say you're presenting the words at 60 dB to a guy who's faking a 50 dB loss. He shouldn't get any of those words. Okay? He should be missing all of them. If his 50 dB hearing loss is real, and I'm presenting words at 60, 60 is only 10 more than 50. Look at the PI function here. If I'm 10 dB above the threshold, you're barely going to be getting them. Okay? So if the guy's getting excellent word recognition at 10 dB above his claimed thresholds, you caught him. He's lying. You've got to be at least 30 to 40 dB above his claimed threshold in order to be doing well. Okay? So excellent word recognition, excellent speech discrimination at levels that are too close to his thresholds. If his thresholds is claimed, thresholds are 50, and you're presenting words at 60, and he's getting like 75, 80% of them, Houston, you got it yourself a liar. Okay, and you know you got yourself a liar because look at how much greater you have to be above threshold in order to achieve a high speech discrimination function. Again, it there are two different tests. SRT is threshold and speech discrimination is clarity of hearing. But too good of word recognition at levels that are too close to thresholds, impossible. So... Shadow audiogram, lack of, lack, or lack thereof is one indication, okay? SRT, not agreeing, with, not agreeing with pure tone average. Third, word recognition or speech discrimination that is too good at too soft a levels for his hearing loss. Those are the behavioral indications. Those are the ones you should be doing when you're assessing loss like this. Now we're going to go to... Here, look at this one. It says Stenger test again. Forget it. We taught, we did that already. That's a that's a typo. Somehow I, I got it in twice. So ignore that. Ignore it. Here's a non-behavioral one. Acoustic reflex. Acoustic reflex. Part of tympanometry. So put a star by this one. Okay. Normal hearing. You should see acoustic reflexes at around 80 to 95 dB. With conductive hearing loss, you'll remember from anatomy or from earlier on, I believe, in this course, they should be absent. Acoustic reflexes are absent with, a con with conductive loss, right here. And with sensory neural loss, you should see acoustic reflexes still until the hearing loss gets to be around 60 dB. After that, you probably won't see them. And we've, we've described why that is the case, too in previous 
Zoom sessions, okay? Outer hair cell damage creates sensory neural loss up to about 50 or 60 dB. When inners begin to die, now you're getting more of a severe loss. And which hair cell population is part of the acoustic reflex arc? Inner hair cells. So if you've got intact inner hair cells, you should still see an acoustic reflex if your sensory neural loss is mild. Okay, so mild to moderate sensory neural loss, you should still see acoustic reflexes. With pseudohypacusis, okay, look for acoustic reflexes that are less than 10 dB above volunteered threshold. I mean, if, if, what's the softest level you're going to get acoustic reflexes? Around 80 to 90 dB. So if the person's faked hearing loss is, say, 70 and he's getting acoustic reflexes kicking in? He's lying. It's impossible. Okay? Acoustic reflexes, the softest that they can ever be, is around 80 to 95 dB. And if you've got a 60 decibel sensory neural loss, you might still have acoustic reflexes at 95. You might. If your hearing loss is 50 dB, you might have acoustic reflexes at 95. You could. Okay? Because inner hair cells are not affected by the mild loss. But if the loss gets to be around 80 dB, there's no way you're going to have acoustic reflexes anymore. Because 80 dB, you've got inner hair cell damage. Acoustic reflexes should be absent. Okay? So again, no test stands completely by itself, but present acoustic reflexes with a severe hearing loss, a claimed severe hearing loss, is BS. You can have acoustic reflexes, though, with a claimed fake loss that's mild. If the person's only faking a 50 dB sensory neural loss, yes, you may very well still see acoustic reflexes. So the acoustic reflex test won't help you in this regard. But if the claimed loss is severe and you've got acoustic reflexes kicking in at 95 dB, the person's lying because 95 is pretty darn close to 80. You know what I'm saying? You've got to have a bigger difference. So again, if the person has a 50 decibel claimed hearing loss, you may very well see acoustic reflexes. So acoustic reflex test won't help you with a claimed mild loss, but they will help you with a claimed severe loss. Here is a test, and you guys can do this. HISs can do acoustic reflexes, so that's all part of your battery. But here we now take it home. ABRs you don't do. Okay, the HIS doesn't do. But let's, we talked about what ABRs are. So let's go down here and look at a typical ABR here. Let's look at somebody with a faked hearing loss. Okay, here we go. Get that thing out. Okay, again, a faked case number one, A, audiogram. There was no response at the equipment limits for the right ear. And look at that, they're all X's. Okay, so again, no shadow audiogram. B, the ABR tracing from the left ear. Remember the ABR that we talked about last week and the week before? How many peaks does it have? Five. Let's draw them. One, two, three, four, five. And that's at 70. The guy's hearing loss, he's claiming in 75 to 80 plus hearing loss. His ABR is normal at 70. You're putting clicks into the ear softer than the guy's thresholds, and the ABR is present. Then you make the tones of the clicks 50. You still see an ABR. You make them 40. You still see it. You make them 30. Okay, but you still see a peak 5. So obviously he's lying, okay? And then don't worry about this. This is a different, different area of the brain, the temporal lobe. Don't worry, it's the middle latency response. Forget it. This is an old type of autoacoustic emission. The black is the noise floor in his ear canal. And this is showing you the presence of autoacoustic emissions. Now, who should have normal autoacoustic emissions? Normal hearing. When you lose outer hair cells, you lose autoacoustic emissions because OAEs come from outer hair cells. So if you've got outer hair cell damage causing you about a 30 or 40 decibel hearing loss, you shouldn't have OAEs, okay? But this guy's got OAEs, 
and he's claiming a 75 decibel hearing loss. He's lying. Here's another person, okay? Case two, test results from a 26-year-old woman that demonstrates bilateral pseudohypacusis. Look at the right ear, way down here. Look at the left ear, way down here. And now look at SRT 60, doesn't agree. Okay, no response for the left ear? Well, that agrees. Hmm, okay, that test, hmm, okay, but the right ear. And now look at the acoustic reflexes. They're all kicking in at 95, 90, 95, 90, 85, 100 for both ears. What do they say in French? C'est impossible. Can't. It's impossible. Okay? And then ABR. Right ear. Look at the peaks. One, three, five, 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 all the way down to 20. And in the left ear, five, 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 five. So he's faking it. Now, you, we don't do ABRs as HISs, but nonetheless, this is a non behavioral test. Here's autoacoustic emissions. OAEs, and we covered this a couple of weeks ago, and this is a non-behavioral test for malingering too. Look at one of the applications, malingering, okay? What are, what are these things again? One tone put, you've got, you've, got, you've got a probe stuck in the ear, and it has three holes in it. One's a speaker for one frequency, one's a speaker for the other frequency, and the other one's a microphone picking up a, a tone. You're putting frequency one and frequency two, and they're separated by a ratio of about one to 1.2. You don't have to know that, I'm just telling you. And they put those in the ear canal at around 70 dB. They go through to the middle ear, activating the outer hair cells, and the outer hair cells produce an, a distortion product that goes back out of the middle ear, back through the ear canal, and is picked up by the mic. Autoacoustic emissions arising from outer hair cells. The probe design, frequency one, frequency two, these are two speakers, and the third one is a mic for detecting the third frequency, which is your distortion product OAE. DP OAE means distortion product OAE. So again, the, the, the probe is stuck in, the two tones are put in, and the DP distortion product is produced by the outer hair cells and it's picked up by the mic. Again, two tones put into the ear and a third tone comes back out. Okay, again, don't worry, you don't need to memorize this at all, but the point is two tones put into an ear separated by a certain amount, you should see some distortion products produced by the outer hair cells. Now here are some, here are some real cases, take a look at these, okay? Sloping high frequency loss. The green is the noise floor in his ear canal, the red is showing the presence of OAEs. And look where they fall down, right in the highs, because he's got high frequency loss. Outer hair cells are damaged. Look at the left ear. Noise floor in the ear canal, OAEs are present in the lows, present in the mids, but they die out in the highs. Yep, that makes sense. Okay. Here's another subject, JC, nice fella. So he, noise floor in the ear canal, OAEs up, 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 all of a sudden, boom, down. Well, look at this, da -da -da -da, boom, down. Look at the other ear. Noise floor in the ear canal, and OAEs, OAEs, and then dropping a boom. Once again, well, it makes sense. Okay, outer hair cells are damaged. Here's a woman who had meningitis as a kid. She was totally deaf, both ears. OAEs, gone. OAEs, gone. Here's a person who has asymmetrical high-frequency loss. Noise floor is the green, OAEs, OAEs dropping, and then, yeah. Look at the left ear is worse, and the OAEs drop off worse. Okay, so OAEs, here's Ted Venema, years ago. I'm no longer 44, okay? My hearing, when I used to work at Unitron Hearing, for Unitron Hearing Aids, normal, 
My OAEs, normal, and then they drop off at the very highs, indicating, yeah, I'm going to get some presbycusis. Going to get some. It's happening. It's starting to die out at the very high frequencies. Doesn't show yet much on the audiogram, but the outer hair cells are beginning to die in the very high frequencies. If I had them done now, it would probably be worse. I think my hearing kind of goes like this now. Kind of goes about like this, and then I drop down about like this. Sort of, I've got about 30 dB loss for the very highs in me. Well, I'm 63, I deserve it. Okay, so that's normal. Anyway, you can see at this particular OAE, when you look at that circle right there, two tones were put in the ear surrounding that frequency. Here's the OAE. Now look, at the, now look over here. Two tones were put into the ear, no OAE. Okay, here's me with another uh, OAE thing. Okay, no, totally different uh, way of showing it, but noise floor is the thick gray areas, and then here's the OAE sticking out. So I have autoacoustic emissions, and then in the other ear, noise floor in the ear canal and present OAEs. Here's a nurse that we used to hire for my dearly departed daughter, the one who passed away this past uh, September. She had uh, Icardi syndrome. Look at this, normal hearing she had in the right ear, and she had sudden idiopathic deafness, the nurse, okay? And she complained that she lost all her hearing in the left ear. Well, look at the right ear. OAEs, no problem. Left ear, gone. Okay, so OAEs, just to really, they are a very, very useful um, non-behavioral test. A very useful non-behavioral test is acoustic reflexes. Another useful non-behavioral test is ABR. So now you have several behavioral tests and several non-behavioral tests. We can just stop sharing and take it home. Behavioral test number one, lack of shadow audiogram. Number two, SRT, pure tone average disagreement. Number three, too good speech recognition or speech discrimination at levels that are too close to threshold. Speech discrimination should get, should get really good when you're about 30 dB above threshold. If you're only 10 dB above thresholds, you should be getting lousy speech discrimination, okay? A faker is going to have too good word recognition because he or she isn't good at equating the loudness of speech compared to pure tones. So the, your 10 dB above claimed thresholds is going to sound like, okay, uh, I'll make sure I'll make a few mistakes here, but I'll still, and they shouldn't be able to get anything. If you're 10 dB above thresholds, your speech discrimination should be nada. Okay? Nothing. Now, non-behavioral acoustic reflexes. Non-behavioral that you don't do, ABR. Non-behavioral that you don't do but could do, autoacoustic emissions. The HIS can do OAEs. There's no law saying you can't do OAEs. Many audiologists love to say, oh no, you can't touch that. But guess what? Nurses do OAEs. Technicians are doing OAEs at hospitals. So don't give me that crap, okay? So you can do them, but it's, uh, we are, and you are taught a little bit about it at OTC, but uh, you're not taught ABR at all. So you, of course you shouldn't touch ABR with a 10 foot pole. Anyway, I'll stop here. I'm done. This is the end of disorders. We're all finished. Does anybody have any questions? I know it's been kind of a long one. I'm about 10 minutes over already. So, But anyway, I'm trying to cram it all and get it done in this session. I guess you have your final exam next week. Is your final exam proctored? I hope not. Yeah, I can't, I can't I don't even know. You know who's the master of all of that is Lynn Royer. She knows all of that legal, all the stuff. Me, I just do the sessions, and then I, I, I made up your quizzes, so you can kill me for that. But uh, I'm not, I, that's my role here, and then she does all the internal, I don't know, she knows how all that stuff works. Like when you guys have questions about your quizzes, and you had a question right, and the quiz marked you wrong, I just send it to Lynn. Lynn, fix because <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> anyway, um, are there any questions that you have, things that you want me to clarify? or?
<sighs> yeah. I just wanted to tell Audra that our 150 final is proctored. 150 final is proctored. That's, That's what it says on the coursework on okay. our home pages. So mm -hmm. check that. If you find a difference, let me know. Okay, yeah, I don't teach 150. I think Rochelle Cluck is teaching it. I think Rochelle is teaching it. And okay, we're in 125 with me. This is yes. 125. And and um, who we were just talking about. Rochelle Cluck, I think she teaches 150. 150. Okay, it's 125 that's proctored then. Okay. But if you find out different, please let me know. I'll let you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's just just uh, send Lynn Royer an email or a quick text or whatever, and she'll she'll get right back to you. She's usually pretty quick. Yeah. She's really good. Yeah. Yeah, she's a pillar of this program, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, you two conniving connivants, I'll stop recording. It's been a slice. I've enjoyed teaching this course, and I will be probably seeing you in the fall. I think you guys have 240 from me. Yeah, good. Compression. And then in the spring or the winter semester, you'll have 250, which is real ear. And I teach fitting methods again in real ear. So the awesome. fitting methods, you're going to get twice. You've had it once this summer, but I teach it again as the first part of 250 next year. Okay. Cool. All right. Catch you later. Live long Thanks. and prosper. Thanks so much, doctor. We love you. Hey, hey see you when we look at you, okay? Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, Bob.